He really, really did want to be here today. He composed this beautiful lecture for us uh, that introduces the major themes of the purgatorio for us. And he shared the text with us, um, but I'm going to have to be his avatar. Um, he's just not able to travel. And indeed, he's not even able to um, really um, present from afar, even by Zoom. So let me say just a quick personal word about all of this. Peter Hawkins was actually the reason that I enrolled at Yale Divinity School 25, 26 years ago. And it was his introductory, introductory lecture on Dante, um, which was the very first class session that I attended at Yale when I arrived there in 1998. Um, I wound up getting diverted and studying a lot of theology, but largely because of Peter, I've never um, left literature behind. I've never given up on it. And in fact, I came to understand that theology could be read as a kind of imaginative or speculative literature. And it was Dante that showed me how to do that. And actually, it was Peter's teaching that helped me to appreciate that possibility even before. Um, but it's only been in the last couple of years that I've returned to the poem of the Divine Comedy. And it has come to serve as a kind of anchor, or one of the anchors, for my own sense of spirituality in the world, and my own sense of orientation into the world around me. Um, I'll, I'll speak more about that on a coming Sunday, maybe in a sermon. Um, but it's led me to, to invite all of you uh, into this world of the poem so that we could inhabit it together to see what we might learn from it. Which is why last year and now this year and next year, I hope as well, uh, we'll be performing this poem in full on Monday, Thursday, canto by canto, canticle by canticle. Now, I wish to say, say the word someone and we'll do an in-depth study of the entire divine comedy together. We could go through it step by step by step and gain a broader understanding of it. Um, somebody's got to say the word, though. Uh, I'm not going to do that to you, but I'll do it with you. Um, anyway, what better way to help us enter this world than to invite my teacher, Peter Hawkins, um, to share this material with us and to orient us not only through the inferno, but now through the purgatorio. As I said in the meeting house, we don't have Peter in the flesh, but we do have his words. And because we have his words, we have his spirit. And because we have his spirit, we also have his enthusiasm and his passion and his love for this material that can lead us up the mountain of God toward the source of life. So while we do wish that Peter's physical presence was possible, we do have his words and we do have his spirit and that is a lot. He is with us from afar. Um, after the lecture, I guess if there are questions, we can, we can have questions, but I can only answer them as me. I can't answer them as Peter. Um, I can do my best and maybe we can open it up to, to everybody. Um, so let's, let's get going. Uh, this is called Purgatory which is an invitation to the second part of Dante's Divine Comedy. You'll find elements of Peter's own personal story, uh, as well as his insights into the text. Here we go. The two poles of the eternal afterlife, hell and heaven, are common property for all Christians. Whether we believe in them or not, they are quite simply there part of our inheritance and cropping up in high and low culture alike. Purgatory is something else, time bound, temporary, specifically Roman Catholic, and relatively late in its arrival on the other world scene. By the way, can you all hear me? Yes. Good. My own encounter by which understand Peter's encounter with it, took place when I was a teenager in the late 1950s, in the days before Vatican II, and therefore at the tail end of Purgatory's glory days. <laughs> Happily, it also came to me wholly apart from the theological wrangling that had long embittered dealings between Catholics, who believed in it more or less ardently, and Protestants, who thought it was hogwash. 
because my Protestant Catholic extended family tacitly agreed never to discuss religion, silence kept the peace among us. If anyone believed in purgatory, it went without saying. But my eyes and ears were open. One day, on my own in Manhattan and always a sucker for church going, I followed a Fifth Avenue throng into St. Patrick's Cathedral and took in the 12 side altars that flanked the nave. Each one was focused on some object of, devo of devotion a moment in the life of the Savior or of the Virgin Mary, particular saints with a local following, Veronica's veil, the sacred hearts of mother and son. Fascinated by the whole scene, I began to keep track of the little placards that also appeared at every shrine. In exchange for the recitation of a certain prayer, one could get a given number of purgatorial days off for the soul the petitioner had in mind. That is, for someone deceased who was now among the faithful departed. Thanks to secondhand acquaintance with the late 19th century Baltimore Catechism, which was required reading for so many of my friends, I understood the basic concepts at work. Anyone who dies in a state of grace, that is, baptized and with even a last breath appeal to God for forgiveness, was on the way to salvation. There should be no anxiety on that score. He or she was most probably not yet ready, however, to enter the divine presence except for those very few whose entire lives had been an extended practice of contrition, the overwhelmingly saintly, most people would die owing a debt for sins that had not sufficiently been repented. Divine justice demanded satisfaction, so too did divine perfection. Since an encounter with God required absolute purity, the rank and file soul would need to be cleansed of a lifetime's accretion of sin before the promised face-to-face -face vision with the Trinity could be enjoyed. They would not be ready to see straight. There was work to be done and purgatory was the place to do it. This made sense. Although the ecclesiastical language was strange to my ears and the sheer confidence of the Baltimore Catechism was breathtaking. <laughs> How could anyone know these things with such clarity and assurance? I was drawn in, however, because purgatory seemed to answer a need. By my teens, I had found the notion of an eternal hell unworthy of God and impossible to believe in. Heaven, although an article of faith, I was happy to affirm, was a luminous cloud of not knowing. Purgatory, by contrast, seemed as if it should be invented if it didn't exist already. <laughs> although the expression, no pain, no gain, was not in currency at the time, its sentiment summed up what I thought purgatory had to offer, suffering for a purpose, not as an end unto itself. Furthermore, the souls of the faithful departed could grow gradually beyond their lifetime's limitations. They could make progress, which is a concept dear to the American heart. <laughs> Best of all, purgatory offered an opportunity for us, the living, to perform works of love for those we keep on loving long after their deaths. Suddenly, the idea of the communion of saints became vivid and with it the possibility that we could help those who had died, even as we were told to assist them when they were very much alive, by praying for them. Unlike the Protestant reformers, I liked the open door between this world and the next. 
Mourners needn't be limited to keening or keeping a stiff upper lip or telling poignant or embarrassing stories about the deceased. We could name them before God. We could remember them at the Eucharist along with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. Nonetheless, I had a hard time with the thought that grace could be managed in as efficient a way as the side altar prayer exchange suggested. I was also troubled by the idea that there were days in the afterlife that sped by in response to prayers recited. The mechanics of quid pro quo were disturbing. Therefore, no matter how provocative my walkabout in St. Patrick's may have been, I ultimately put the whole business behind me when I left the cathedral. Purgatory. Like white commu First Communion outfits, meatless Fridays, and weeping statues was meant for Roman Catholics, not me. Nor was I encouraged to take it seriously by my Episcopal training. Joining the chorus of the Reformers, the Book of Common Prayer's Articles of Religion dismiss it as one of the Pope's detestable enormities. Quote, a fond thing, vainly invented and grounded upon no warranty of scripture, but repugnant to the word of God, unquote. John Calvin was equally withering. Purgatory, he wrote in the Institutes of the Christian Religion, is, quote, a deadly fiction of Satan which nullifies the cross of Christ, inflicts unbearable contempt upon God's mercy, and overturns and destroys our faith. Wow. <laughs> this heated controversy was ancient history by the time I began my theological education in the late 60s. Purgatory never entered the picture during my three years at Union Seminary, nor has it ever arisen in any serious conversation with Roman Catholic friends. Imagine my surprise then, when I had a vision of my deceased father in what I can only call purgatorial surroundings. I am sorry to report no lifting of the veil. At best, I enjoyed a visionary split second. Nonetheless, at the time and now in retrospect, I believe I had an insight into what purgatory might mean or even for all I know what it might be. What I discovered was neither a place nor a state of consciousness, but a scenario, or better yet, a jerky sequence of still images such as you see on surveillance camera footage. I had a glimpse into something. My father died in 1988 by which time I had moved my parents from their home in New York to a retirement community in West Hartford, Connecticut. And the extended family dwindled to a handful of people with whom I had lost touch. Because two years had gone by since dad's death and no one else had gotten around to organizing a proper funeral. I felt out of a primitive sense of what the dead are owed that I needed to make a move. I asked the parish priest at Christ Church in New Haven if it would be possible to offer the next Saturday morning Eucharist in memory of my father. I wasn't entirely sure what I was asking for. I only knew it was time to get those ashes out of my study's closet. <laughs> the priest was happy to oblige. And so, with the very odd assortment of people who go to an Episcopal Eucharist on a Saturday morning, I prayed for the repose of Thomas William Hawkins, Sr. During the service, my mind wandered, as it inevitably does in church. 
I soon found myself thinking about my father with regret over things done and left undone. Ours had not been a relationship made in heaven for which I had come more and more to blame myself. Nor had I ever reconciled myself to the extraordinary caution that had characterized his entire life and that had inhibited mine. Anything new was fearsome. Everything cost too much. And taking risks or living improvidently was what other people did, not us. Imagine my surprise then when at some point in the liturgy, I suddenly beheld my father in what looked like a casino, <laughs> gleefully wasting money with a zest I had never actually seen in him. A depressed survivor of the Great Depression, he had always been pathologically careful not to spend. Money was to be held on to, saved for a rainy day, or simply saved. It was never wasted. But there he was in my mind's eye, in the fluorescent light of a gambling hall, quarters flying, one-armed bandits pumping away, as if there was no tomorrow. He was definitely not in repose. He was a very happily agitated man in full smile mode. Who was this person? I wanted to know him. When I came to my senses afterward, wisely making no mention of any of this to the priest at the door, <laughs> I wondered if I had seen my father in purgatory as he was learning to let go and have fun, no longer burdened by the need to save, but free at last to be crazy and irresponsible. At first, playing the slot machines would have been painful, perhaps even a torment, because wasting money was against his personal religion. It was the unforgivable sin. But maybe this is what happens when you die. The arms of mercy that receive you set you loose in a place where you would not otherwise be caught dead. <laughs> maybe they bid you to do the opposite of what you had done in life, nudge you to go to the other side of the territory that you had mistakenly confused with reality. Rather than being as comfortable as an old shoe, as satisfying as a long-held dream come true, maybe, maybe the afterlife came as a rude shock. Maybe it hurt. Hurting was largely what purgatory was supposed to be about. Thanks to what historian Jacques Le Goff called the church's move toward infernalization, the idea of terrible punishment in purgatory has prevailed for centuries. Even today, as close to me as the Mission Church in Boston, you can still find representations of souls almost totally submerged within painted flames, their agonized faces crying out for rescue. Dante certainly accepted this notion of purgatorial hurting, along with the other theological premises sketched above, but he completely altered its atmosphere or feel by challenging the primacy traditionally given to suffering. His purgatorial spirits are, as Virgil explains even before the journey takes place, contenti nel foco, content within the fire. The reason is they have something wonderful to look forward to. Quote, 
they hope to reach, whenever that may be, the blessed people. The poet was not the first to make hopefulness the mark of purgatory, nor would he be the last. Two hundred years after him, Catherine of Genoa wrote a treatise on purgatory that speaks of its joys as ardently as she would of its pains. But no one else has ever come near the totality of his rendering or the extent of Dante's makeover. Dante began with an overhaul of locale. Instead of imagining purgatory as an underground antechamber to hell, he placed it ranging along the terraced sides of an immensely high mountain that rose up from the otherwise empty seas of the southern hemisphere. It stood at the antipodes from Jerusalem, which was believed to be at the center of the inhabited world. The mountain was beautiful, adorned with art, and crowned by the lush fertility of a garden of Eden that was watered by just two rivers, not the biblical four. There was Lethe, borrowed from the classical world, in which the rehabilitated souls forget past guilt, and there was Unoe, Dante's invention, in whose waters the former penitents recall the moments of grace to which they were oblivious when alive. What is perhaps most immediately striking about this above-ground reimagining is that Dante's purgatory is not shrouded in the traditional gloom, but bathed in gorgeous light. The pilgrim arrives there just before dawn, when the planet Venus is said to make the whole sapphire-hued east smile. From this first starry moment onward, his journey takes place, or bides its time, en plein air. His path is illumined during the day by a sun that rises and sets in great beauty. At night, when the sun is silent, there is a brilliant recompense in luminous planets and constellations. Freed from the claustrophobia of hell, we find ourselves not only newly risen from the grave, but part of a cosmological pull toward the heavens that in every sense draws the penitence upward. Also striking is the way Dante constructs his purgatory to be not hell's close cousin, but its mere opposite. He imagines it by contrast as if in Purgatorio, the comedy's second canticle, he was programmatically developing the dark negative of the first. Whereas the pilgrim descends into hell, moving to the sinister left, he climbs the mountain always according to the right hand. In hell, he moves from the sins of the flesh to those of the will and the intellect as he goes from bad to worst. Conversely, the purgatorial pilgrim starts out with the most grievous disorders in intellect and will before passing on to those of the flesh. While the gravitational pull of hell is strongest at the bottom, the pilgrim finds himself almost in flight as he approaches the mountain's summit. The contrasts continue. Rather than being like hell, therefore, Dante's purgatory is as systematically unlike it as possible. From a hole in the ground, he gives us a mountain skyscraper. From a descent into darkness, a rising up into light. The mountain itself is divided into three discrete sections. At the base are gathered souls not yet ready to begin the hard climb. There are those who repented only in the last desperate moment of, moment of their lives. Those who, through sloth, barely repented at all. 
and those who were so preoccupied with worldly advancement that they neglected to prepare themselves for the life to come. The souls ripen as they develop the necessary spiritual strength to begin the serious business of rebirth. When they are ready to do so, they work their way up the terraced walkways, each dedicated to one of the seven deadly sins. Appearing in the order first established by Gregory the Great in the sixth century, these are first pride, then envy, wrath, sloth, avarice prodigality, and gluttony. Last and truly least comes lust. The weightiest sins are located at the bottom of the structure. Those of lesser gravity arranged at the top. It's interesting that we in the United States tend to reverse that. <laughs> The terraces lie just inside a massive gateway with an angel guardian and an elaborate entry rite that involves the inscription on the pilgrim's forehead of seven peas. Each is a sign of the residue of a peccatum, a sin that penance will erase. Once within the gate, repentance begins in earnest with painful self-confrontation and arduous acts of contrition. Yet as the poet counsels his readers on the first of the terraces, the point of the process is not pain, but gain. Don't dwell upon the form of punishment, he says. Consider what comes after that. What we are not meant to dwell on is a variety of penitential ordeals. The heavy burdens borne on the shoulders of the proud the sewn-up eyes of the envious, the corridor of purifying fire through which the lustful, who were evenly divided between what we would now call heterosexuals and homosexuals, who knew? <laughs> to see each penance enacted, moreover, is to foresee its eventual termination. The proud will cast off their dead weights, the blinded envious will see. The lustful will step out of the fire and into the Edenic garden that blooms verdant and welcoming on the other side of lust's burning path. Rather than being a penitentiary, in other words, purgatory is a hospital for the healing of brokenness. Purgatory is a school for the learning of truth an incubator in which worms grow up to be butterflies, a conservatory where soloists become a chorus and where speakers develop a use for we and for us instead of only I and me. Life sentences are not served here so much as lives are rewritten. Other analogies offer, however anachronistic, also spring to mind. Purgatory is a naturalization center where refugees from Earth, my Boston, your old Lyme, learn how to become citizens of the city of God. Or to put it yet another way, the whole experience of the mountain can be likened to psychoanalysis where the patient painfully unties the knots of the past so as to live more freely in an unencumbered future. Vice is a sickness to be diagnosed and cured, not merely a blemish to be painfully burned away. Whereas hell was all about the compulsion to repeat an endless replay of the sinner's endless song of myself, Purgatory, by contrast, is dynamic, dedicated to change and transformation. It concerns the rebirth of a self 
free at last to be interested in other souls and other things. It is all about renewal, about the experience of becoming new. What the souls in purgatory have in common, no matter how ill-prepared they may have been at their time of death, no matter the extent to which they are still works in progress, is their final turn toward God. Self-involvement is essentially what Dante understands sin to be, a destructive narcissism whose impulse is to erase the other in order to secure one's own, quote, divine right. Every compartment of hell is full of fresh examples. In the course of moving through it, moreover, we also see that solipsism is never a victimless crime, but is always social in effect. A private kiss can bring down a kingdom. A single counterfeiter can debase an entire currency. The opposite is true as well. We learn in Purgatorio that virtue can open up locked doors, can bring a new understanding of life that amounts to a reinvention of the status quo. Provenzanzo Salvani, Tuscany's most arrogant grandee in Dante's day, set up shop as a beggar in the Campo of Siena. Quote, to free his friend from suffering in Charles's prison, humbling himself, he, hum he trembled in each vein. What but love could have led such a person to, quote, set aside all shame and prize someone other than himself? Love is the key to purgatory. As Virgil explains in Canto 17, the comedy's midpoint. The terraces of the mountain are designed with the redress of disordered love in mind, vice paired with virtue as the penitent moves from the grip of the one to the freedom of the other. The most grievous sins are clustered lower down, where alienation from love is most apparent. Arrogance is considered more deleterious than lust, for instance. Those sins closer to the top represent a mistaken or excessive desire, which once led souls to pursue a lesser good with the zeal that should have been reserved for God. Food was misused, creature comforts made too much of, sex pursued in ways that were compulsive and unhealthy. The journey up the mountain, therefore, deals first with the disorders of the higher faculties before turning to those associated with the flesh. On each of the terraces, a particular failure in love is suffered, rectified and transformed into a virtue that corresponds to the vice. The proud, as I've noted, suffer the heavy burden of their egos, which are represented by the rock under which each one is bowed. Their punishment is to carry this increasingly oppressive and false persona until they can willingly let go of it. When they are able to do so, they stand tall, which is to say stand humbly, at last free of what they mistakenly thought to be their true self. The imprisonment of the vice is transformed into the freedom of the virtue. The self-important worm becomes the angelic butterfly. The butterfly it was always meant to be. Throughout this work of transformation, the souls, in effect, go to church. 
They worship themselves clean and they sing themselves free. The Beatitudes are chanted on each terrace, as are other prayers, hymns, and psalms, such as the Miserere, the Te Lucis Ante, the Salve Regina. But the Beatitudes have a particular role to play. They are recollections of Jesus' sermon on another mount, indications of the virtues that have been acquired along the purgatorial way and foretastes of life in the heavenly city that is the pilgrim's destination. They are also the antiphonal response to the erasure of each of the seven sins that were marked on the pilgrim's forehead when he began his ascent. A rhythm then takes over. On the terrace of pride, for instance, an angel sings, Blessed are the poor in spirit. When the penitent makes an exit and the first peccatum is whisked away, one expects to hear the singing of the corollary, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, but does not. All such corollaries are left unvoiced on the mountain, but are, but are by no means forgotten. Each is embodied in the person of the penitent, who now enters into a new stage of beatitude. In every case, the angel gives the versicle, and the penitent, and the penitent is the response. The newly humbled soul, poor in spirit, is ready to inherit the kingdom. How quickly this liberation takes place depends on the individual soul, the extent of past sins, and the assistance that has been given within the communion of saints. The church calculated time in purgatory as a sentence measured out in years and even days. You served your time and then were freed. Dante avails himself of this concept on occasion. Yet the overall spirit of the purgatorio is not to emphasize the calculation of penitential years to be spent. We understand that the proud are released from their burdensome egos, not so much in answer to an external clock as in response to their own maturation. They will, quote, terminate, to recall the analogy of psychoanalysis, when their spiritual work, their conversion of virtue into vice, is complete. When that happy time comes, the mountain shakes with joy as the other penitents sing out, Gloria in excelsis Deo. Like the angels at the Nativity, they celebrate a new birth. At the summit of this entire penitential structure stands the Garden of Eden the, quote, nest into which humankind was born and wherein the purged souls celebrate their spiritual rebirth before moving on to the heavenly paradise. Dante's decision to plant Eden atop the mountain of purgatory was a master stroke of theological geography, one of his many bright and original ideas. By crowning penance with innocence, he illustrates that what was lost to humanity by the first Adam has been restored in the redemption wrought by the second. We owe this typology to Paul, as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive, from 1 Corinthians 15. As if this weren't enough, the poet has positioned Eden at the antipodes from Jerusalem, the place where, according to the Apostles' Creed, Christ suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. Dante gives us paradise regained, a territory that is rooted and established in Christ. Along with the theological reinvention of both the earthly globe and the afterlife's middle kingdom is the elaborate, emotionally charged encounter that unfolds in the garden. 
the pilgrim's meeting with Beatrice. Here, some background is in order. According to the Vita Nuova, a spiritual autobiography written in poetry and prose at the beginning of Dante's career, Beatrice overwhelmed him from that moment in their childhood when he first set eyes on her. The ensuing story is stylized, filled with swoons, misunderstandings, and hopeless idealizations. Adolescent, in short. Yet for all the highfalutin romance, a core truth emerges. Through the eyes of love, we see something more than we had ever bargained on. Dante encounters another person more real than himself and a power that transforms everything. He says, I glowed with a flame of charity that moved me to forgive all who had ever injured me. And if at that moment someone had asked me a question about anything, my only reply would have been <coughs> love. After Beatrice's death, she returns to him in a series of dreams and then in a vision of her in divine glory that is so beyond his present powers to describe that he has to defer writing about it until a later time. He says, thus, if it shall please him by whom all things live that my life continue for a few years, I hope to compose concerning her what has never been written in rhyme of any woman. Undertaken roughly 15 years after the Vita Nuova, with other works of philosophy and linguistics begun but left unfinished, as well as rough erotic poems addressed to other women, the comedy becomes that occasion. It is Beatrice who activates the pilgrim's journey to God at the very beginning of the narrative. And it is the prospect of seeing her again that enables him to descend into hell and endure the pain of purgatory. Her name needs to work wonders and does. To seduce the pilgrim to step into the cleansing flames of the terrace of lust, Virgil coaxes him. Now see, my son, this wall stands between you and Beatrice. When Dante still holds back, his guide tells him the whitest of lies. I seem to see her eyes already. At last, standing before him in Eden. Beatrice is veiled and hidden from view. Nonetheless, she is still unmistakably herself, and so is he. Trembling now the way he used to when she was alive, he confesses, I felt love's ancient power. And then he says, I know the signs of the ancient flame. Veiled though she is, and surrounded by figures of the seven virtues, the encounter is undeniably hot. <laughs> We are no longer in the land of the Baltimore Catechism, nor do other renderings of purgatory renowned for its flames imagine anything even remotely like this kind of fire. Once we enter Eden, the familiar array of religious practice we've been dealing with along these terraces, the exchange of vices for virtues, the painstaking step-by-step -step process of rebirth, the prayers and songs and sacred iconography now culminates in something quite new. 
the language of the church transposes into a startling fusion of spirit and flesh, of piety and passion. Not a drop of blood is left in me that does not tremble, Dante says, about the woman who will bring him before God, in whose gaze he will come to see reflected the splendor of eternal living light. And yet, Dante cannot look directly into those unforgettable eyes or marvel at her dazzling smile until he first experiences the sting of her wrath. This comes as a complete surprise. Nothing in the poem has led us to expect Beatrice's fury because all that we have heard about thus far are her shining, tearful eyes and her gentle voice, her compassion for his spiritual plight. Not now. She may be his ancient flame, but from her first spoken words, spoken from within the veil but with gloves off, she burns with an icy fire. She says, Dante, though Virgil is leaving you, do not yet weep. Do not weep yet. You'll need your tears for what another sword must yet inflict. There are no signs of welcome or affection from her. Nor will she abide his weeping for Virgil, who departs undetected in the midst of her arrival. Taking no prisoners, Beatrice's tongue is a two-edged sword, and her ferocity astonishing even to her companions, the virtues. Witnessing her fury, they plead with her for moderation. They say, lady, why shame him so? We might have assumed once the pilgrim entered Eden that he was beyond such treatment. After all, just moments earlier, Virgil said the pilgrim was free, upright, and whole in his will. That he was crowned and mitered over himself. Apparently not. If Dante's experience is anything to go on, purgatory requires not only a general purification of the sins of the past, but a very personal confrontation with those who have been most important to us, inevitably those that we have wronged the most. As confrontations go, this one is not pretty. Beatrice rails against Dante's failure to make anything out of what he had been given. Not only was he richly blessed in talent and opportunity, but quite specifically in the gift of her love. Once she died and was no longer in the flesh, he was given dreams and visions and other sorts of inspiration, all intended to lead him back to the true path of Eros which they had charted together. Instead, he lost himself by following a false path. Why? Given the buildup, the reader expects some epic betrayal or carefully mounted excuse. Instead, the pilgrim answers through his tears. Present things with their false pleasure, turned my steps aside as soon as your countenance was hidden. In the intense experience of this particular love, he was shown how to ascend to the sun and to the other stars. But once the beloved was gone, and with her the incentive to persevere, he fell for superficial brightness, 
fool's gold, substitutes for the real thing. He, quote, moved on and got nowhere. Presenti cosi. Stuff got in the way. He forgot what it means to love. What in the world does this lover's quarrel in Eden? This fury of a dead woman scorned and the sniveling, if honest, response of a living man. What does any of this have to do with God? And why should a romantic crisis serve as the climactic emotional moment of the purgatorio? I think the answer has to do with the high theological value Dante places on human relationships, and in particular on the potential of romantic love to lead us to God. One may fall in love with ease, but afterwards it is painful and uphill work as the ascent of the mountain demonstrates terrace after terrace. Working against negative attitudes toward Eros that are as much classical as Christian, that dismiss it as the source of madness, destruction, or the nearest occasion of sin, Dante presents a counter-argument through the figure of Beatrice a revaluation of eros, of the erotic. Human love is not only as strong as death. It is perhaps the most powerful way we can come to know God. To demonstrate this, Dante forges a dramatic link between Beatrice and Christ that begins in the Vita Nuova and then flourishes in the Commedia. In the moment that initiates the journey recounted in Inferno II, she descends into hell to bring about Dante's salvation from an infernal dark wood. He remains mindful of her descent into the depths all the way down into the abyss and then again as he spirals upward along the mountain. At her first appearance to him in purgatory, furthermore, she is greeted by the acclamation that Christ received on the palm-strewn streets of Jerusalem, Benedictus qui venis, blessed are you who come. Grammar would demand that Beatrice be Benedicta, but the poet retains the masculine ending of Benedictus in Latin in order to reinforce the connection between his Lord and this lady. She serves as his Christ figure, a personal mediator between his own humanity and God's mystery. Dante recognizes this intercession in his final words to her in paradise. This lady, like his Lord, left her footsteps in hell for his salvation and drew him out of slavery into freedom. In the Inferno, the poet explored Eros as a lethal narcissism through the figure of Francesca. Amor is her mantra, the charm that mystifies and misleads. She holds on to her beloved Paolo for eternity, yet what does she really see in him, her silent partner, but a mirror of herself? In Beatrice, however, Dante discovers how love can lead to the way, the truth, and the life. Rather than be a dead end, it can open a door to the most profound reality. According to Charles Williams, whose brilliant theological reading of the Commedia, the figure of Beatrice was of such importance to both Dorothy L. Sayers and W.H. Auden, this trajectory from human to divine was not only what Dante was focused on, but essentially what all true love is, quote, up to. 
The only question, Williams continues, is whether lovers are up to love. How one learns to be up to love is the preoccupation of Dante's purgatory, the realm of the afterlife that is most like earthly existence because unlike hell and unlike heaven, it entails change, possibility, and the suffering that is bound up in both. Although it presents the state of otherworldly existence least familiar to Christians who are not Roman Catholic, and then only to Catholics of a certain age, it is nonetheless the most accessible portion of the comedy to relate to and to appropriate. Purgatorio is a poem to live by. The contrast with Inferno, once again, is instructive. Writing about hell gave Dante the chance to present us as stuck, at a loss, trapped in the never-ending compulsion to repeat rather than to transcend ourselves. It is the nightmare we are lucky to wake up from and the portion of the larger poem that most people know by reputation, if not through actual reading. Inferno is the terrible accident on the highway that none of us can pass by without gawking. The horror that we want to turn our back on but cannot. Drawing, no doubt, upon his own heart of darkness, the poet draws us in and holds our attention. Dante's rendering of purgatory may feel less compelling, perhaps, but it is infinitely more useful. It opens up a process whereby what has long been stuck gets loosened. Knots are painstakingly and also painfully untied. Nothing stands still. While hell had its moments of frantic exertion, none of the damned actually gets anywhere. The storm that buffets Paolo and Francesca never relents. Runners in a circle, and there are many throughout that sorrowful kingdom, arrive at no destination. Purgatory, however, presents us with what our three score and ten might look like if we were truly in via, on the way toward our best hopes. It offers a liberation theology that can be lived out, not just in some imagined other world, but in the middle of the journey of our life. Look carefully at the mountain's terraces and see what it is like to get over yourself. Then there is that climactic scene in the Garden of Eden where one person looks at another and truth has its day. The tradition teaches us to imagine a frightening end time judgment encounter with Christ, which in some sense is what we find at first when Dante stands in the bracing presence of Beatrice. Yet if the moment is sobering, it is not terrifying. After being in motion, the pilgrim comes to a halt. Love confronts him with face unveiled and shows him all of God that can be reflected in human eyes and human mouth. The moment is brimful to overflowing. Had we ever imagined that the divine could come this close? Could be so bound up with whom and with how we actually love? 
the Purgatorio asks us to imagine a place in the afterlife where such revelations dawn over a period of other world time for as long as it takes. The burden of the poem, however, has to do with the way we live now. The goal is to learn how to be up to love, no matter how painful the lesson. But really, why wait for the world to come? Now is the time. The end. <laughs>you can begin to see in the hearing in the reading of this text how this poem would be something worthy of spending a night going through <laughs> on Maundy Thursday but i think more importantly i think you can see how this poem might be worthy of a lifetime's investment of a lifetime spent reading it and memorizing it and learning it I think it's that important. I think it's that rich. I think it's that good. And I'm midway through the journey of my life. Maybe, who knows, but midway. Um, and I'm only now beginning to sense that maybe this is something worthy of investment over the course of a lifetime. But I want to see if you all have any responses or reactions or thoughts or questions or just things that maybe came to you as, as the text was being read. I thought it was really interesting that Beatrice being a woman in that period of time is held up as the beacon, the fountain of wisdom and closeness to God who in those days yes. was perceived as a man. As a man, Jesus. yeah. Isn't that remarkable? And, um, yeah, I mean, I just thought given it's nowadays it wouldn't be surprising, but in right. those days to have the woman be the pinnacle. Yes, yes, no, I think it is, it is very refreshing, it is very surprising, it allows us to see and to understand the divine feminine, the divine feminine. Here's another very, very interesting thing. You would expect that at the end of the Paradiso, which we'll come to next year, that there would be this encounter finally, at last, with Jesus. But Jesus never, fully shows up. Jesus never comes because in fact, I think, as Peter points out to us, Jesus has already come in the form of Beatrice. Beatrice is Jesus for, for Dante. It's a remarkable uh, invention, theological invention. But here's the other thing it invites us to do, I think. It invites us to imagine our own, if you will, erotic lives, our own erotic others, and to imagine who might that person be for you? That person who activated the deepest part of your being, sexually, but also emotionally, spiritually, everything about you. Who was that person? And who might, what might it be like to imagine that person coming to you? And to understand that as the coming of Christ for you for you. So if Dante can do it with Beatrice, you can do it with whoever that might have been in your life or might still be in your life. That's a radical move. Then and now. And it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Anyway, yeah, Lee. I, I don't know much about the um, divine comedy. I haven't read it. But I think that the Beatrice is the Yes. Well, and this is something that Peter probably should be the one to answer and not me in his absence. Um, I, will, I will simply say that um, um, Dante was married. He was married to a woman who he never writes about. Um, after he's exiled from um, the city of Florence, he never, to our knowledge, sees her again. Um, and 
And while he's still married, he composes this poem for Beatrice, this early adolescent love that he never was able to give up. Uh, it is true in the Vita Nuova um, that, that there are these moments where Beatrice spurns him, where she rejects him, but she also, there's a, there's a relationship that does develop between them, and then she dies, and then she dies. Um, it's an awkward adolescent love story. I read it this past year, and um, it, it, I mean, it, it's got its moments of beauty. It's not the divine comedy, though. <laughs> Um, so anyway, there, there's, this, there's this way in which um, biographically it's, it's radical as well because the person he's writing about is not the person he's married to. It's not the person he's married to. Um, it's, a, it's a grand fantasy, if you will. It's a fantasy. I mean, this is, this is, I, mean I think this opens such interesting theological territory for us. The fact that, that, that our, ter our, our fantasies actually can be the occasion for the coming of God, for the coming of God. I mean, that's a radical thing that Dante is giving us. It's, it's a radical thing. Bill. So just the other thing about the feminization, I mean, and then it's Beatrice that, that is his guide yes. in the, in the, in the, the, the uh, Paradiso. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, no, Beatrice becomes the one who guides him through heaven. Yeah, not Virgil, not Virgil. Um, folks, I want to say before everybody gets up and goes that um, we have sign-ups over here. And I, I, want to, I want to urge you to take a canto. And um, I'm going to have, I do not have the um, uh, photocopies made yet, but I will get those to you in the coming weeks uh, before Monday, Thursday. Um, but the sign-ups are here, and I'm going to keep on beating a drum about this because I think it is worth spending a night with these powerful words, with this powerful concept, and it might even be worth spending more than a night with these words. Um, it might be worth spending a lifetime. So thanks for this, everybody. Thank you.